I'm here with Dr. Manan. Dr. Manan, what brings you here today? We're here to discover the Bronx through the Historical Society's presentation at the Bronx Museum, the Valentine Varian House. Okay. And um, from there we'll, we'll be able to um, get an idea of the colonial and early history of the Bronx, which ties together with the more modern era. So we, we're very hopeful that we're able to... And here's some of your students here. Some, Everybody excited to come out today? That far back. So Dr. Manan, what was happening? Come, come a little closer, right? So what was happening back then during the revolutionary period? Uh, it was a period of, of turmoil uh, between the Tories and those who were the Patriots. And of course, the, um, the African-Americans who had been slaves in the Bronx were caught in the middle. The English had offered them freedom if they fought on the English side. And of course, they were offered freedom on the American side as well. But at the end of the day, uh, very few of them got freedom. The slaves did not end until 1827 in New York State. But we do have some good stories about abolitionists, such as Mr. David Mavis, who was a lawyer. We had a house not too far from here. He hit some of his slaves in his basement on their way to the Underground Railroad to Massachusetts and Canada. Mm -hmm. And yet others as well. Um, so the story of resistance continues and there's a line between resistance and the South in terms of how, what Harry Tubman was doing, what was happening here in New York as well. Harry Tubman? Yeah, so we, there's a connection. And so we're, we're, we're at the Bronx end of, of the trail. We're at the Bronx station of, of the Underground Railroad. Okay. See that? You know that, right? Yeah. So, it's something to look at. Um, and then we had a period of immigration uh, right after the, the Revolutionary War. Uh, 50 years later, a lot of Irish are coming here in 1839, 1840, 1841, fleeing the potato famine. And of course, there was conflict between the Irish who came here, who were looked at as the black Irish, who were called the black Irish. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and African Americans, who had those jobs of doing masonry, carpentry, and skilled work, and also unloading the docks. So there was conflict there, and of course, we you know that within uh, 30 years of the Irish coming, there was the, the Civil War and the draft riots of New York and how there was conflict in terms of people being drafted who were poor to fight in the war. Right. But if you had $500, you could pay your way out. I guess you paid their way out. Mm. The people who had the Morrises, the, 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 million, the millionaires by their standards. So what, what does 500 translate to current currency? I would say 5,000. Okay. Yeah, five thousand because maybe a little more, maybe a little bit more than that. Because you, you can take a trolley car for, for a nickel. What mm -hmm. it cost to get on the subway? Two seventy-five. No. So both of, go put five into the two seventy-five. And what, do you, what do you get? Fifty times the amount. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. So they're paying five hundred dollars. Fifty times that amount. Right. Two thousand five hundred. So what were the other trails that Harriet Tubman led? What, what, what other states? She was up and, up and down the, the uh, Mid-Atlantic, uh, from the south to the Mid-Atlantic, and then to, right into New York. And um, of, of course, she was not the only one. But something she said, which talks about what we said yesterday in class. She said there were th a thousand slaves that she liberated, and she would have liberated a thousand more if they knew they were slaves, right? Oh, wow. All yeah, right? Wow. So oh slavery, is a, slavery is a duplex experience. There's a physical plantation uh, that was part of the labor, the, the triangle of labor, you know, capital, free labor, other people's money, the corporations, the triangle we talked about yesterday. But there's a mental aspect of slavery, a mental plantation, mm -hmm. where people who were slaves were laboring under false concepts of identity. Mm -hmm. Those false concepts of identity uh, enriched the people who enslaved them and impoverished their aspect of who they, their aspect of self-concept and who they were. So. When you labor under ideas that block your freedom of expression, etc., you are a slave to these ideas. But someone is benefiting from those ideas, and it was the master class who, who benefited from not just the labor of the slaves, but from what the slaves had been taught. Of course, in 1832, Senator Henry Berry, the Virginia House of Commons, had said something which defines the mental plantation. He said, I have we have cut off every light avenue by which light can reach the Negro's mind. 
And if we cut off all avenues of light to reach his mind, he would become, become like the beast of the field, and then we would be safe. So the idea of slavery was to turn the uh, human beings into uh, tools of labor as oxen and cattle and so forth, not able to respond. So, to so their property? Yes, yes. So that's the mental plantation. So to the, to the extent that it existed in New York, slavery might have ended in 1827, but it continued into 2027. You want to say because the same idea we're laboring under. You know, the idea that an education will lead to a good job. It's a great idea. Well, it's a slavery idea. It's, hmm. a, it's higher education. H-I-R-E. Higher. higher. You're being educated so you can be hired by someone. But to think that you could have your own business and you could hire other people, you could sign the front of the book, it's a, it's a liberating idea, even if you never do that. But you, you, I, to believe that you could do that, that's liberating. liberating. So we're still under this mental plantation. Once we identify those concepts, you will understand what slavery was really all about. It was about heads and tails. The, co the currency of slavery was about heads and tails. Heads were the people that were leading the society and ruling it. The tails were the stories that they told us about who we were that made the society uh, good for them, <laughs> but not good for us. Mm -mm. I hope I'm making it plain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, let's we'll stop here. Yeah, all right. Let's say some of it for the guide tour, right? Somebody should be in there. Okay. Hey, any idea what you're looking at here? What is this? A house. A house, right. What was it, what was it built? Hey, hey, All right, hey, how you doing, Clarence? Hey, hey, hey. You're a great guy. Look, bottles of water. He's still in the Bronx, <laughs> <laughs> there are three rooms in this uh, facility that you can actually view. It's the colonial room on the right side. That will tell you about the house and its importance to the Bronx and also to America. Um, and then our exhibition rooms, which are on the women's suffrage movement, as well as the Bronx Expo. Um, now I'll just need to speak to whoever is in charge to deal with the admission charges. Okay. Um, but if you could all just also sign the visitor register and you'll have free reign to walk around in the museum and i'll give you small details um because i don't know if i could give the whole tour to the everyone because i don't know if they'll fit in right. part of the rooms so mm -hmm. okay. well, but we could try he's coming in here, he's coming in here. yeah okay Uh, this room is in chronological order, so we're going to start off with this wall and then work our way around. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I guess I guess I should start talking about is a little about the area of the Bronx. So this is a map of the Native American settlements, and you'll see Manhattan down here, and then the Bronx right above it. And if anyone wants to volunteer to try to pronounce the Native American tribe that was here, you'll see the name right there. Anyone want to take a stab at that? Go ahead. I'm on no What What do you say to that? Oh. No. Algonquin, no. 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 right? Alright. So everyone usually gets it wrong, but it's the Rich Gow Walks. What? Rich Gow Walks. Yeah. Um, but so they're, they're a branch of the Algonquins, aren't they? Yes, they were part of the Algonquin tribe. Tribe, yeah. Yeah, but that was the group that was actually located in this area of Manhattan, and then right above in the area of the Bronx. Um, so they actually made the first contact with the Dutch West India Company when they actually came here to do business. Um, and these two pictures are renderings of them when they actually came. So when they actually arrived, there wasn't a peaceful interaction. They actually had battles and skirmishes. Um, it's hard to really see it through these pictures, but they did. And this ship was also supposed to represent Henry Hudson's ship. And he's actually who we named the River after. 1609. He's here. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so after the skirmishes and battles, they had to find a way to come to a peaceful agreement. So they did so. Um, and then this picture is a rendering of that. And Jonas Bronk is the person who actually helped in help with signing the treaty. And he's in, right there in the middle. Um, and he's actually who we named the Bronx after. His last name was actually with a CK and not an X. 
but we changed it so that we could pronounce it easily. Uh, and then the Dutch West India Company also had their own map, which highlighted what was most important to them. And the landmass that was most important was the island of Staten Island. And that's because it gave them a better view of the ships that were coming in through the ports. Here you'll see Manhattan, and then you'll see the area of the Bronx. And then Jonas Bronx has his two houses right there in the southern part of the Bronx. Any questions so far? All right. So, um, moving on, we're going to get into the colonial period where the, uh, <laughs> the first settlers came from the first Brexit. At least that's what I like to call it. Uh, right before the American Revolution. And some of the items that are in these glass cases are what were actually uh, used in those times. So we have the spoons and the forks that were actually used back then. The forks actually look like uh, pitchforks, not the forks we use in our common day. Um, then we also have the uh, container that held the salt, uh, playing cards, the knives, um, the sewing kits, and even something called the juice harp, which was an instrument that troops had used to put in their mouth and then uh, entertain themselves. We also have some pottery that was found um, that the Dutch West India Company actually brought over. Um, the broken portion of a wine glass stem and the bowls of smoking pipes. So I'll allow you to look at that for a few seconds before we move on to our next thing. Uh, when the Moors came, they brought forks with, with, they didn't speak with their hands. But the fork represented a replacement of the hand, and that's how it came to into Europe. So we don't get credit for that, but that's something yeah. that you know. Okay. So the next part of the story is actually going to involve the house itself and why it's so important to the Bronx and also to America. So the house was actually built in 1758, and it was built by a man named Isaac Valentine. He was a farmer and a blacksmith. And that's actually the last original door from that time period that led to his blacksmith shed. Um, if there's a picture of it here of what the blacksmith shed used to look like. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing on the other side because the blacksmith shed was torn down in 1903. Okay. Wow. Um, oh, it was found to be unsafe and it was breaking down. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the house, when it was actually built, was situated on this map here, off of Boston Post Road. And Boston Post Road was actually that street that's actually down the, there um, at the corner. Um, <laughs> and it was, is now called Van Cortland Avenue. Um, so where that tan apartment building is right now, if you guys can look out the window, is actually where the house used to be situated. Um, the reason that it was moved was because over time, the the person who owned the house, William F. Beller and William C. Beller, wanted to preserve the house. And in order to do so, they had to move it to a park property that the city owned to make sure that it wouldn't be torn down. Um, but now I'm going to backtrack and go back to the reason why the house is really important. So when the, during the American Revolution, when the colonial troops actually were traveling from their forts in Man northern Manhattan and also the southern part of the Bronx, they would actually take the bus from Post Road up to Boston. And when they did, they would pass by the house. They wanted to use the house as a station uh, during the American Revolution to try to fend off the British. So the General Heath actually came here and made a deal with the Valentine family to use it as a station during the American Revolution. Under two the family agreed under two conditions. The first, to remain neutral throughout the war, and the second, to make sure that the land was unpillaged and preserved. Um, unfortunately, the land was pillaged because in times of war, the troops needed to sustain themselves. So in order to do so, they took the crops of corn, wheat, and they took the livestock back to their forts so they could feed the rest of their troops. Now, the troops were inhabiting the house for some time, but then the British became strong enough to actually uh, pushed them back out of the house, and then the British actually ended up occupying the house next. And they made the same deal with the Valentine family to remain neutral and also to try to preserve the rest of the crops that were left. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, long story short, you know who won the war, but now the Valentine family was left in a financial um, situation where they couldn't really support themselves. So they had to try to sell off their house and land. 
So they did so three times in an auction and failed, but their family friend, the Varians, so Isaac Varian, who actually owned a farm in the Yonkers area, actually bought the house and land from them. He was able to offset the cost and still managed to bring the house back to a point where it could provide for the community and for themselves. Um, but at that point, the Varian family lived here for, by themselves until about the 1900s. And then over time, the house was um, preserved and maintained, moved across the street and made into a landmark. And now we use it as a museum of Bronx history. Any questions? No. No, that's what we doing over here. Yeah. Why is it so hot in here? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, right? Uh, Especially back then, right? It's the original spring. Yeah. yeah. No air conditioning. Uh, well, first of all, we talked about this in class. These roads that we have, Boston Rose Road in particular, right. is an old Indian trail. They started in Manhattan and went all the way up to Canada. And uh, African American slaves built out the road, these roads eventually. Of course, Fifth Avenue became Jerome Avenue and divided the Bronx between East and West. But the important thing to know about the, about the courting of soldiers, that there's a quartering act that His Majesty King George ordered for Americans to allow British soldiers to be quartered in their houses. That was the law. So this guy really didn't have a choice. Right. It wasn't that he made a deal. That was the, His Majesty's law. So he would have been, you know, either you go willingly or unwillingly. So to understand that's the context of, upon which he made this deal to have the house available to the, to the British troops. So a few of the things that they had in the past were uh, this thing that looks like a cheese grater is actually a lantern. Um, we have some of the cherry tomato preserves and pickles. I wouldn't suggest opening those. Um, yeah, that's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, there was also that's from before. Uh, no, 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 that was a recent. Uh, recent, yeah. Last around, last uh, last I assume from around the '60s when the house was actually uh, moved over, um, but still, still. Right. <laughs> Um, the tin cups is what they use to actually drink their alcohol or water. The feather uh, was actually used to write. Right, right. Okay. We know that much. Okay. What the president used to write. Did y'all like leave the final? Yes, the house was renovated over time to make sure that it was still stable. So How many even, times? Uh, well, various times for different little things. Um, but the top of the fireplace, this is not original. Um, but they had to support the floor above, so that's what they did. Um, some of the floorboards, the smaller pieces of the floorboards, those are more recent, but these larger ones are the ones that are original for the, to the house. They expand and contract depending on the temperature, so that's why you hear it, yeah, and that's why you hear it squeaking. Uh, the door, the cabinets, um, and a few other things in different places in the house. Um, Is that a cabinet or a dumb waiter? A uh, cabinet. Um, the thing that looks like two towers is actually a candle maker. Mm -hmm. In the past, they used to take the wick and dip it in wax, bring it out, let it dry, then do it again several times to get the width that they needed. But with this mold, all they would do is just put the wick inside, put the wax in, and just let it dry. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last two parts of the colonial period were the, this trap door, or this area, this dip in the floor. This was a trap door that was for cold storage, because there was no refrigerator at the time. So they needed to keep their food cold. Uh, they would put their meats, their vegetables, and their fruits down there. Because it was built on the ground, the floor is always cold. It would keep the food cold enough for them to actually preserve it. Um, even if the meats had fungus growing on it, they would just cut off the part of the fungus and cook the rest of the meat below it. Okay. Um, you <laughs> yeah, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only problem is that's probably why they didn't live as long as we're living right now. So. <laughs> and the last part of the colonial period was actually in that glass case behind me. Or to your right, sorry. The window um, Unfortunately, I can't in case squirrels walk, uh, jump through the window. <laughs> it's happened before. <laughs> um, but the this last thing here is actually some of the equipment that the troops had used during the colonial, uh, during the American Revolution. This is for the equipment for the colonial troops. As you can see, there's no jacket in here because at that time, people just actually went to war with whatever they had um, in regards to the colonial side. So you'll see the hat, the satchel, the canteen. They usually had two of them, one for water and one for alcohol. Um, 
they actually kept their gunpowder in this horn here. Um, you'll see the musket balls and the uh, grape shots that were used. Uh, well, this is a musket, so it was like a bullet. Um, Rome, yes. <laughs> Um, so the problem with the musket is that you had to always keep it clean. If you didn't, it would actually backfire and blow up your arm. Yeah. Oh right. So they would usually take the uh, ramrod and something over here that looks like a corkscrew is called a wormer. They would actually make sure that they wormed out the barrel of the musket to make sure that it was always clean. And if it wasn't, that's when you would have the issue. Um, so everything in here from this glass um, level up is a reproduction, but the cannonballs, which are found around the area of this Bronx um, community, were actually found um, while they were excavating and developing the area. Um, and the cannonballs are made of iron, that's why they look like they're rusting as well. And that would be it for the colonial period. Yeah. <laughs> Are there questions? Yeah. <laughs> a, couple, a couple comments over here. Uh -huh. um, going back to the corn. Yes. All times we think the corn is an American dish, but it's really a truly a, a Native American dish. Right. And that's how it got to Europe. Along with, with potato. They next to me had the french fries. Potato didn't come from here, it came from Native Americans no. as well. <laughs> and regarding the weapons, um, the reason why these weapons were a, a disadvantage to the uh, British after a while was because Native Amer the um, American troops, the Patriots, learned from the Native Americans how to conduct guerrilla warfare and not line up in front of each other and both move each other down. So because of that, um, George Washington was able to save his army a couple of times, although in the beginning he fought the European way, facing the British troops. And because he didn't have the supplies and the number of troops, they lost. So when they began to do asymmetrical warfare, that, that became a disadvantage. For the British, they didn't help them at all. Uh, not, not to mention the fact that they were cut off by the French who were um, embargoing any kind of food or weapons coming to the uh, British from outside. And that's, that's one of the reasons you didn't know why the Americans won the war. And the last parts of this wall are in regards to urban development and the achievements of the Bronx. Uh, no achievement. Okay. So we have the 19th century. Um, where the high bridge was created. There was an advertisement for a runaway slave. Um, the reward back then was $10. Uh, that was in 1813, and uh, slavery did official, or officially end in 18, 1827. Yes. Um, we also had a railroad system that was developed, and that's around Port Morris and Spite and It was um, heavily populated by African Americans because they're the ones who were actually put to do the work in regards to laying the uh, rails out. Um, Edgar Allan Poe lived in the Bronx as well. And then there was also an influx of immigration which brought um, the Germans, the Italians, and the Jewish population, and Irish. Um, and with them they brought a few things like um, breweries so they could make beer. They brought um, decorated taverns. Um, even the seafood industry, which was located in the uh, Yankee, no, actually, no, the <laughs> Yankee Stadium waterfront. Uh, this is actually a picture from a play on the. That uh, was one city bush? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and then the last picture down here is just a picture of Italian immigrants standing in front of work, road work, showing that um, development is occurring in the area of the Bronx. Um, what area was that? That was, I think, 149th Street, and, uh, yeah, um, 149th Street and Cortland Avenue. Um, and what most people don't know is that the Germans were here even before this influx of immigration because the Germans were hired as mercenaries for the British troops. They were called they were, Exactly, they were called yeah. Hessians. And um, most of them after the war stayed here <laughs> and created a family. Sorry, pardon me. <laughs> So, so wait a minute, did he say the slaves helped to build this house? Yeah, they built this house. And they were servants in this house, and they lived in a separate cabin, cabin outside of this house. So I asked them where they, I knew they had slaves, but I said, where did they live? They lived downstairs or? Yeah. Right. But they lived outside. You go to Jamel Mansion or something like that in New York, you know, you find the slaves have quarters. They have separate quarters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so they were just the construction workers. They didn't. They weren't the architects. They didn't design this. No. They maintained the house. They didn't design it. Although some slaves were capable of doing that. Right. You know, you Banneker, mean, Banneker, Banneker was one of them. Yeah. And slaves. Um, up until the time the Irish came, they were they were the skilled workers. They were the masons. They were the, the uh, carpenters. They were the blacksmiths. You went to a blacksmith. He usually was a black guy. He was a slave. He made the pots and pans and things like that. But when the whites started coming in overseas, they banned blacks from these trades. So we became just Damn. domestics. Is that what the union was built for? Them? To like kind of abandon them? Kind of, the they built, could, they built. couldn't come. They couldn't compete with the blacks that had all these trades. No, the blacks were. They were being arrested really for, for, be, for being a barber. They were arrested. Rest Get out of here. No, that's okay. a skilled trade. Yeah. A barber was also a surgeon. He could do some yeah. medicinal things. Okay. So that was something that we had all of that. Yeah. When we were slaves, we were we were the skilled workers in the, yeah. in the colonies. But when uh, later on, when the immigrants came, like the Irish and the Italians and others, we were banned from those, and those unions. Exclusively yeah. for Caucasians. Yes, right. Yeah. How about the yeah. Native American Indians? What type of skills did they possess, or did they learn from the Africans that were born there? Native Americans had a whole set of skills on how to live in this woodland area. They were woodland Indians, and they were Native Americans. Sorry, and they had skills in how to build housing that was cool in the summer and warm in the winter. <laughs> As we explained in class, the long houses were the first apartments in concept, the one they want to build. Vertically, they built this way. Right. And families occupied those houses. Of course, the families belonged to the same clan. You had basically four clans: the Wolf Clan, the Turkey Clan, the, the, the Crow Clan, and the, I believe it was the Crow, Turkey, Wolf. I forget the last one, but mm -hmm. each clan had different roles. The Crow Clan were involved in a Wolf Clan. They, they were involved in hunting. They were experts hunting, and the Crow Clan was involved in burying people and taking care of people. So as the name suggests, there are certain duties that each clan specialized in, and everybody participated in the process of gathering food. So, you know, to the max. Holy no shoni means one house, one people. That was the greeting. That was the hello. Holy no shoni. Some of the some of the, the Native Americans taught their languages to the, the Europeans, and they were, were able to talk to each other. But some of the names still exist. You know, Manhattan. Manhattan. That's right. right. Manhattan, right? We right. read about that, right? right? We read about that, right? So, so, so when the ships came, the, the students were asking this. They came from Southern Manhattan and trail up here this way. Where did they dock most of the ships? Oh, um, Valley Park. Valley Park. Oh, yeah, down yeah. the harbor. Oh, down there. Down there. Yes. Right. Right. What is? And the wall was built to separate that 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 city, New York, New Amsterdam, from the Native Americans. Keep them out, basically. Wow. And they were built by African Americans, and Wall Street also <laughs> became the place where the, it was the first business. Of Wall Street was selling slaves. Mm. That's why mm. they got the mm. African burial down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The slaves live in a separate town. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 But that okay. wall was built, and it became a market for for the slave trade. Wow. Okay. And of course, near that wall, there were other businesses like the New York Life Insurance Company and others. Who wrote policies on slaves? Yeah. Hard for J. Uh, J. P. Morgan and whatnot. J. P. Morgan was an opium dealer. Oh man, get out! He made his money selling opium in China, and wow. he was one of the financiers of, of interest in the in the um, opium war. The British and Americans made a lot of money selling opium, and when the Chinese emperor said no more opium, the, a war broke out because we that's wanted. That's they made their money. Yeah. Well, they made their money, so that's yeah. where the war went. You gotta follow the money, right? Yeah. Yeah. You have a question, sir? No, no, I, I can't remember. Oh, right. oh I'm it's sorry. Well, J.P. Morgan was a um, opium dealer. So, what was when they said that they had the, um, when you were talking about the war, they were saying that they had the blacks live close there so they can let them know if they were going to um, have a, a war or something? Blacks were living on Cath uh, around Catherine Street. And um, there was something called the Negro Lots, which the, where they were buried. Um, they were living there. But Catherine Street was the main settlement. Yeah. Of blacks who living outside the outside the, the wall on Wall Street, and the Catherine Street slaves came from Long Island and other places. Joined on Sundays and Saturdays when they were off, and there was an actual market there where they traded things, and there was there was also entertainment there, um, and uh, tap dancing and things that came out of the American Springs started here in Catherine Street. Hi, David. Is it true that uh, Black Friday started down there as an auction? Is that what the Black Friday was about on Wall Street? 
when they would have the auction know. down there? I don't know that. Uh, 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 right, I know what you're talking about. They said that that's where it started yeah. from. Yeah. 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 Selling the yeah. auction in slaves with the real Black Friday. Yeah. Came from. But I know that, 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 that was a major place. Yeah, okay. The North was, in, was involved in slavery yeah. financially. Yeah. Right. It was insurance policies. They gave loans to people to buy slaves. Mm -hmm. People took out loans against their slaves as collateral. So a lot of our banks were built off of slavery. Lehman Brothers were mm -hmm. slave brokers. Yeah. There were two, two slave brokers down in Georgia. And when the war went, when the war was lost by the South, they came to New York and bought two seats on the soccer team. That's how they got to New York. They sold slaves. <laughs> they, bro they were nope. brokers. You know? nope. The brokers, you understand, slaves were commodities. They, were, they want people yeah. legally. They were property. 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 It was called, in, in the law, they called chattel. Mm -hmm. You have three types of property. Intellectual property, which is like copyright. Mm -hmm. You have real property, which is land, and then you have and then you have um, chattel, yeah. which is like this. Cars, horses. Yeah. But we will consider to be chattel. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. bought and sold mm -hmm. and traded. Insurance policy, like you write insurance policy in the car, yeah. but insurance policy is somebody like you might cost a lot more than somebody like me. If you're more valuable, you might you expect to live another forty years of work. Oh, right. I expect to die in the next ten years. Okay. So your insurance policy is gonna be high. New York Life and Hartford, these companies made their uh, money on this. Untold Legacy, which tells the history of the financial ties of the North to slavery in the South. Untold Legacy. Legacy. Third World Press. Third World, um, Third World Review is a publisher. Sir Julius Truth is an ex-slave who went on a, on a journey to uh, accomplish the abolition of slavery. Yeah. And she's very proud because she was a woman that was an advocate. She spoke, went around to different places and spoke. And she was so dedicated that she didn't have any kind of work. She relied on people who donated to the cause. Mm -hmm. and she had a famous prayer. She, she said, Lord, you know I don't have no money. And you sent me on this job, so you got to do something for me. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's one of our prayers, right? right. <laughs> and so she said, pray for what you want. Yeah, she, yeah. so she, she was always uh, sustained. But she was also part of the women's suffrage movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she advocated that women could do the job of men. And she wrote a poem called Ain't I a Woman. Yeah. And that poem said, I could do whatever a man could do, basically. That's right. You know, give me my respect as a woman. Don't discriminate against me. Of course, the American and English system of, of how women were dealt with, women considered to be property. <laughs> on the English law. They, women could not own real estate. They had to own real estate through their husbands. And women could not vote, of course. And uh, women were considered the property of their husbands. That's why you give your last name. Your name was uh, Mrs. Mercer. Ms. Mercer. You married Mr. Jones, you became Mrs. Jones. So, yeah. Well, that's how it is. Yeah, yeah. The marriage certificate was a certificate of property ownership. <laughs> that's my wife. My property. So that's yeah. important to understand the perspective of the movement and, and so general truth is important from that perspective too. Because we're not property, we're humans. Yeah. As humans we're equal. Yeah. And we're partners in the human experience. So that's the perspective. Thank you.